following program is a presentation of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio in iTunes. And now, it's time for the show that breaks down the options market. From unusual activity alerts to market updates and trading strategies. If it involves puts and calls, then our all-star panel will break it down. Break it down. It's time to hit the option block. With your host, Mark Longo from theoptionsinsider.com. And co-hosts, Mike Tussaw from KnowYourOptionsInc.com and Mark Sebastian from OptionPit.com. The Option Block is brought to you by Options Express. Don't spend time worrying about your broker. At Options Express, security, stability, and account protection are the most important responsibilities to our customers. Secure account access, enhanced financial protection, entrusted with over $7 billion in customer assets, established financial stability. Options Express lets you trade with confidence. Stocks, options, and futures, all in one account. Trade with a specialist. Visit optionsexpress.com slash OX radio to open your free account. Options Express is a member of FINRA, SIPC, and NFA. All right, everybody. Welcome back to the Option Block, your bi-weekly source for all things options related. My name is Mark Longo from theoptionsinsider.com as well as the ever-expanding ever informative options insider radio network and if you haven't had a chance to check it out yet i recommend you certainly check out our latest program the options news rundown it gives you quick hits for all the top news stories in the world of options a great way to start your day if you're an options trader an options user someone in the options industry whatever your case may be uh, check out the options news rundown and also if you're going to be in chicago next week may 15th we'd love to see you there at the cboe Nice and, actually not that early, nice and <laughs> in the afternoon. Let me try that again. Uh, we'd love to see you next week at the CBOE on May 15th for our unusual activity forum. Starts at 2 p.m. for the floor tour, so if you're going to join us, then you want to be there a little bit early so you can get registered and get past security so you can see where all your favorite options trade during the day. Interesting stuff. If you haven't been down there, I recommend you do it. I recommend you do it soon because the floor isn't exactly getting any younger and healthier. Of course, the recent outage at the CBO may put a little wrinkle in that, may give open outcry a bit of a new life, but we'll get to that down the road. In the meantime, let me introduce the rest of my cohorts here on the Option Block All-Star panel, starting off in terms of distance with the man beaming in the farthest today. He is none other than the Rock Lobster himself, good old Andrew Giovinazzi from OptionPit.com. Mr. Andrew, welcome back to the program, sir. Well, as always, great to be here. Great to be here on this Monday when uh, we have, oh, just a few more highs to talk about, <laughs> except for Zynga. Yeah, good old Zynga. <laughs> <laughs> Always the fly in the ointment. Good old Zynga. But that's a little Sell tease. all options. Yes. Care not about the direction. <laughs> yes. Good old Zynga. We'll get to them in a bit, but before we do that, also joining us on the old program today, the man, the myth, the legend. You know him, you love him, perhaps you hate him, who knows? We don't know. So write in and tell us. <laughs> no, of course you know him and you love him. He is none other than the man from the mountains, a.k.a. Uncle Mike Tussaud from RCM. Uncle Mike, welcome back to the show, sir. Always excited for Mondays. New week, fresh week, fresh attitude. Let's get after it, baby. That's what we hope to do here with the old option block. Turn the conventional wisdom upside down. Everyone always hates Mondays, but we turn Monday into a fun celebratory day full of options, fun, and trading information. Of course, our listeners get it on a Tuesday, but we here on the show get to have all the fun on Monday. It really starts the day off right. And as if life couldn't get any better, only four more months till Monday night football. <laughs> there you go. Then your life is truly complete, sir. And speaking of being complete, our panel is not complete without the Viceroy, none other than Alex Jacobson, the educational major domo over there at Options Express. Alex, welcome back to the show, sir. Hey, Mark. Uh, we like Mondays, not if there's an expiration every week. Every week is expiration, so uh, it's fun. 
and uh, things were okay on the desk here today. Not, not, not. It wasn't a ton of activity. I think we're all going to echo that. But uh, talk about two names today, Apple and Tesla. So yeah, happy to be here. Good old Tesla lighting up the old tape. Interesting how that one's just kind of creeping up on everybody's radar over the past few months. And we'll get to that right now in the trading block. The trading block. All right, and welcome back to the trading block. This is, of course, the portion of the show where we run down the day's worth of action from an option and volatility perspective. And as Andrew kind of joked at the top of the show, it wasn't it wasn't too much action. It was a decidedly unch day on the old street, particularly when you look at the days we've had recently over the past couple of weeks where we had a lot of 1% moves in both directions. Today, uh, the S&P closed up fractionally, uh, about two-tenths of a percent. The Dow unched on the day, essentially, and the NASDAQ leading the charge a little bit, a little bit of tech love today, as Alex was referring to earlier as well, up nearly half a percent on the day to close at 33.92. That is the leader by far on the day, of course, VIX Cash turned into the dark side ever so slightly down, uh, not even not even two-tenths of a point to 12.68. So overall, compared to the days we've had recently, today was a bit of a ho-hum one. I didn't see too much that was really uh, lighting up the old fire. Of course, Andrew did uh, did joke about Zynga. Perhaps we'll start there just for fun because I, I always love, love twisting the knife with Andrew, Andrew on old Zynga. They, of course, had their earnings recently, and it wasn't exactly a, a stellar uh, announcement by any stretch of the imagination. They announced they're slashing about 5% of their workforce. They're closing offices in the U.S. and Hong Kong, I believe. And uh, just uh, not exactly a, a ringing endorsement for their business model. They're essentially, they essentially said they're putting all their eggs in the Farmville 2 basket. So like, if people like to make farms the first time, they're going to love it again. So I don't know if that's exactly in a resounding endorsement of their business model or not. Andrew, as the one here with the most skin in the face, I'm sorry, Facebook, with the most skin in the Zynga game, at least until recently, are you still... You still a lover of those bullish risk reversals out there on the three three half strikes? Um, I used to. I'm, I'll tell you what, I'm not as much in love with them. Uh, I'm still. I still think. Well, everybody doesn't think this is. I still think the real money gambling and stuff. They're going to have a place in this business. Uh, but ultimately, they do make revenue. You know, they still have what about a billion dollars a year in revenue or something like that. Yeah, I think it was about a billion dollars, which kind of surprised me. And they got to do what every other young company does. They're, you know, they grew, they hired too many people like too fast because they thought they're going to have exponential growth, and now, you know, they're doing what they need to do. They have to cut expenses, make sure they're making money, and so I mean, it's not like it's, it's not. I'm not going to spin it as that it's great news, but they're doing the kind of things. A company, if you got, you know, you manage your expenses and clearly they've got some to go. So, but yeah, I think still, uh, I still like the idea of the, uh, at this point though, I'm not as excited about buying the calls unless it gets only a risk reversal for credit. I would not pay any, no debit whatsoever anymore for them, for sure. Looks like you can get the bulk of them off here, May and June, three, three half, uh, for about even, it looks like. So I think you can you can yeah. probably get some of your free juice going if you don't mind socking up on Zynga at the three level when it plummets to oblivion. But other than that, uh, it's uh, exactly it seems to have been it's been pretty. It's having a hard time breaking through there at least to the downside again. So yeah, because you're right, they do That's have some I just revenue. Think, I think they're they're whatever they got going, they're kind of starting to reorganize to some degree, and you know that's what you do. What are you gonna say? It's definitely not a huge winner. But that's what you got. I guess they finally got some adult supervision over there. They can't run the place. I guess the go-go 90s anymore. We just went public. Let's go acquire an app maker for $100 billion in our faux stock currency that doesn't really exist anymore. I hope those guys all collared their their positions pretty quickly as soon as they got the payout in stock. Uh, I'm going to guess not. Yeah, I'm going to guess that way as well. <laughs> that should be it. Someone should do a study on massive corporate corporate uh, takeovers that were paid in stock and how much subsequent money was lost <laughs> in, the, in, the, in the subsequent months from people not knowing how to collar and hedge their positions and just watching those things erode to zero. I think one of the best examples I can think of is Howard Stern. We got all that serious money uh, in stock. Hopefully he had someone on his payroll who could knew how to buy a put because I don't think that stock ever looked back. Uh, and how many he got hundreds of millions of dollars worth of that stock. So hopefully he he knew how to buy a put or two in his day. 
and that uh, that served him well. But that would be an interesting study, I think, just to see how much wealth has been eroded by a lack of knowledge in this space. Well, the Cuban guy did that too, Mark Cuban. I think that saved him. Yes, I heard that as well. He, he made he made that one deal, which and that's funny. He's this famous quote unquote businessman now. He made one deal. He made broadcast.com and he's he sold it to Yahoo for their full currency of four hundred dollars a share of stock. But yeah, he had the forethought to or the foresight to buy a put. And that's all it took. Yeah, I have a story. You only of- really need to make one great trade, apparently. That's it. <laughs> Just ask George Soros. All right, go go ahead, Alex. Yeah, I was gonna say it's too long for the show, but uh I have a broker buddy of mine at what used to be Payne Weber who sat next to a guy on an airplane one time who had a billion dollars of global crossing, which is a stock that literally went to zero. And uh, they negotiated a collar and salvaged about $700 million. And uh, when we have more time one day, I'll I'll tell the story because this is one where I can actually name names because it's been in the press. But collared a, a billion dollars worth of global crossing uh didn't didn't you know do strikes right at the money but did about a 70 delta and salvaged 700 million dollars out of a stock that uh is wallpaper today there you go i Mr. love <laughs> salvage 700 million i love those two in the same sentence that's awesome there you go. Like, that's, that study should be front and center for you and you're meeting with all your clients for the first time let's just read this and, and see how much this guy salvaged and then let's talk about what we can do for you Love it. <laughs> Speaking of what you're doing out there for your clients, Uncle Mike, what, what's catching your eye in all this activity? Of course, Alan, Alan. Of course, Alex alluded earlier that uh, Apple still uh, on a bit of a run, rallying another 10 handle, almost 11 handles today to 460. Just on the freaking on the on the tier ever since they essentially announced that put around the 400 level. Uh, did that embolden you to to get out there and get a little more aggressive with Apple? Well, I didn't embolden. We, we've been doing some weekly put spreads on it, or we have the last week anyway, and I'm just staying, keeping my distance from it because we're at the 420 strike, probably close that out tomorrow. I'm debating over closing it out today, but I decided to leave, leave it for another night. But uh, just still selling the put spreads below it on the weekly level. I think we had some decent premium on it last week, and if we still have that, uh, that's how I intend to ride it up, so to speak, because I, I don't see it going back to 700, but I've been wrong before. And when you're not busy rolling puts out in Apple land, are you looking at GLD? What else is taking up your attention? You, you, you playing in this Ford rally? What's catching your eye? Well, in GLD, we're still sell, selling some weekly premium again. Uh, we, we sold the 143 covered calls last week, and we got out on Friday for a, uh, a few penny, like four, 13 cents, I believe it was. And then we sold the 144 weeklies today on the covered calls. So uh, there's some weekly premium out there, and it just got to be real pretty nimble right now in it there is a, i do see from a technical standpoint a possible top coming in the next around this pricing area but if we break through it i'm giving very strong thought like right now if we start getting to like the 144 145 level uh, typically my first move to the upside would be to roll the call higher up and out or something along those lines usually sometimes not always but right now what i'm looking at i think that we might be in for a little bit of a rally in gold and we may be just uh going into protective put mode and shifting from collar mode to protective put mode which i don't typically like to do too often but i think we might be there ah taking the old top off again letting the dice fly Letting the rally carry you along. Well, and the the other reason for that is that with is with gold, if gold vol goes down a little bit more, then I think there, it's justified in doing so. Now we had an interesting guest on volatility views a few weeks back, and I'm not sure if you had a chance to catch it, Uncle Mike, but we talked about a number of different interesting topics, including the vol and the skew out there in GLD and in the big futures, and how uh, if you were buying protective puts to the downside on GLD, even in some of the more shall we say, aggressive movements to the downside in, in, uh, in GLD, you still ended up overpaying from a skew perspective. It simply didn't, uh, didn't perform up to those ridiculously inflated levels that they had out there. Not to, say, not to say that you lost money overall in that trade. It still worked out. But it's just interesting to see how things got so crazily bid up in that tail risk out in, out in gold right before that big crash. Yeah, we were in before the tail risk got up with our from a vol standpoint. But yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, vol is something that you have to look at all the time, and um, it's a very important thing in looking at it. Speaking of vol, we touched on the VIX cash earlier today, and of course, it is ticking down to about 0.2, two tenths of a point or so on the day to 12.66, well below that 
200 day moving average which is hovering a little bit north of 15 right now about i think about 15 and a quarter or so in that range so substantially south of that i, I caught a little uh snippet that caught my eye today mr andrew and our listeners if you listen to our options news rundown program you heard this this morning as well that uh looking out we talked last week about vxx and how that name performs versus the vix itself and how that's a very popular uh, very popular ETN, ETF for a lot of people trading these days. Well, I had no idea last week exactly how popular it has become. In fact, it was put out today that uh, VXX is the number three exchange traded product by volume right now. It's averaging about 53 million shares a day. Uh, it's traded already this year over 4 billion shares. Obviously, these are contracts. These are shares, not contracts, listeners. So keep that in mind. But uh, And it's already surpa- surpassed its 2012 total of 3.6 billion shares already just by May of this year. So, Andrew, does that come as a surprise to you, Mr. He Who Oft Mocks VXX? Well, we, we, we mock it because it sucks. I mean... That's, that's Tell us how you really feel though. right there. We fuck it because it sucks. I, I mean that that's the the that it's it is reliably crappy. Unlike the TVIX, which was just which was just so poorly managed, it hosed everybody. Uh, but the VXX, uh, you know, it's it's rolling itself out of existence. It buys a decaying asset, and that's you know, and that's what it is. So it it just because something trades a lot doesn't mean. It's going to go up. <laughs> so I think the uh, what's the VXX of the last four years reverse split three times. And if four years ago, if you would have paid a thousand dollars for it, you'd probably have uh, 20 bucks left. <laughs> so it's not a the product has just because it hasn't performed very well doesn't mean it doesn't trade. I, I think it's a good product to trade. It's a good way to trade volatility if you understand how it works because there's a lot of interesting nuance in there. But but uh, from that point of view, I mean, we have a little VXX position on, long, long in the money puts and short some out of the money puts. And just playing uh, the role yield, the fact that um, you know volatility is fairly low, it's one of the few places to go where you could um, sell – the VIX futures without, you know, a tremendous around upside risk. He just by puts in the VXX or something like that. Um, lots of trades that you can make in there. But, yeah, it does not surprise me. The options are really liquid. One of probably one of the more liquid option contracts. It's not as liquid as the VIX options. But, um, but yeah, no, no surprise that it trades. Uh, I think a lot of people continue to buy the VXX to play a bounce in volatility. And, you know, Probably nine times out of ten, they are disappointed. <laughs> yeah, that, that did, <laughs> hugely actually, disappointed. That volume did surprise me too a bit, though, just to see the degree that knowledge and interest in VIX has permeated to the masses. Because you don't reach the number three exchange traded product by just being exclusively, uh, you know, a, an institutional product. There's obviously a lot of retail floating around in there too, and a lot of them obviously have interest in this product, interest in volatility, and they're willing to settle for a very substandard product. Clearly, rather than, than going to the futures, they're not, they're not trading the futures. Uh, so it's very interesting to see that VXX has become this surrogate uh, for VIX. And it would be interesting to see how much those, those options, how to look at the numbers, see how, how they relate. I'll the, just tell you, 300,000 option contracts a day. How does that con- compare, contrast to the VIX options numbers? I don't have them up here. Uh, right it's, I think it's a half, is, it's uh, 50% off. I'm looking at it right now. But I think the VIX trades around 600,000 contracts. Up oh, 584,000 contracts. So yeah, right, right around that level. Not bad so off the top of your head, sir. Yeah, not too bad. Oh, well, you know, I do look at this stuff. Well, yeah, so, yeah it is interesting how many people have gone a little bit farther afield from the standard plain vanilla, quote unquote, VIX options to find something else, and then I guess they really want that underlying. I don't know. Interesting, interesting. Even if it's imperfect, they want it. Exactly. I, I think if people realized how imperfect it was, they'd be a lot more selective. And I think the actual you know, we might see a little more volatility out of it. I just, and what's amazing this year is because it's actually performed, you know, um, it hasn't really gone anywhere. It's done a lot of gyration, but for the most part, what is it down? 25% on the year or something like that. So it's not like it's had a banner year, uh, performance wise either to generate, um, to generate that, those kind of numbers. But, I always see the VXX as kind of the product of choice when people want to play a bounce in volatility. They go, you know, uh, I think some retail customers, you know, just traders, they come into market three years ago. The last thing they remember is the VIX goes to 80. 
and they see the VXX at 18 and they're like, oh, this is a scoop. Uh, because, you know, the Fibonacci retracement is mean reverting, blah, blah, whatever they come up with <laughs> as an excuse, uh, not knowing it's a product is a mean reverting product itself. And all whatever little geek oz they use to look for direction aren't going to work here because this is tracking a totally different banana. So, but it it does, so I, that's where I think, I think there is a lot of retail interest in it. And just, so January, where do we start the year on 25 and a half? Um, so it's down around seven bucks. So it's down 25%. And most likely, by the end of the summer, it will probably be trading around 10. Yeah, I don't think it's had anything to do with performance. I think it really, they could be imperfect all day long. They clearly just want something they see as a good analog for, for VIX and VIX futures in the securities world. And it does and move. They've, they've you know, the good thing is, is it is a good analog because you do get that one handle move to one and a half you know, handle moves depending on the vol swing. So... It, the product does trade the vol swing for sure. I mean, that's why it is – That is, I, well, I find it a very useful product anyway. There's lots of retail research that doesn't want the heavy lifting of understanding the term structure that drives people to the, to the ETFs and the ETNs. And, and uh, that's the distribution system. I mean, it's – the interesting thing would not – be to look exclusively at the volume numbers, but to look at the open interest numbers uh, to see how much of it really sticks. And unfortunately, I, I don't have that in front of me. But keep in mind, in the at least in the individual investor community, um, there are lots of firms that simply won't let you craft a lot of strategies other than simple strategies uh, if you're going to trade the VIX. And so unfortunately, they drive you to Things like the ETFs and the ETNs with the expectation that the heavy lifting will be done by the, the fund manager. And to your point, Andrew, you, you, you know, you give up a lot. Uh, but for some people, it's the only choice they have. You know, it's interesting. We had uh, Tom Sosnoff on the radio oh, about on our Vol Views program probably a little over a year ago. You know, he of Thinkorswim and now a Tasty Trade fame. And he made a comment. I think they got a lot of people's hackles up and we got a lot of a lot of feedback on. He said, essentially, for retail, the vast majority of retail anyway, futures are essentially a moot product. They simply have no interest in them or have no knowledge of them, and they have really are, if they do, they're terrified of them. I think, you know, like I said, that got, that got a lot of reaction from people saying, well, that's crazy, but I think the explosion of success in a product like VXX is kind of hard to, uh, to naysay that kind of opinion, but clearly that's at least somewhat the truth here. I agree, too, because I've had conversations with clients and prospects through the years just about UNG and USO, and even going through that, I said, okay, if you if you trade the futures contract, it's the equivalent of trading this many shares of UNG, UN, USO, whatever the case may be, and you know, I'd explain to them about how things are rolled and how it's not necessarily the exact same movement, and it had, I've yet to get a convert, so to speak, on that, and... I don't know. I I agree. It's someone people are scared of futures. Yeah. yeah. Welcome to Arissa. <laughs> exactly. And they're willing to settle for these very very imperfect products because it, they can put it in one account and they can kind of sleep at night. So. Well, I mean, you think about it. When when do people don't want to play for convenience? I mean, in this society, you want to start a business, you help, you make something more convenient that Every delivers some value. So yeah, every time you try I think these guys have been trying to hit on a lot of these type of products and like, hey, you don't want to trade the VIX futures, fine. They're very confusing. Just trade this product and we'll trade the futures for you. And it, you know, and I can see how that can be, you know, how that can be very appealing. We've built an empire, Andrew, on making the options market more convenient for people, at least trying to <laughs> in the process. Uh, and it's I, I and I think we're trying to do the same at Option Pit and you know Options Express and and. Uh, and Mike at RCM, all the same things, like saying, hey, the, most people get in trouble because they use the products the wrong way they were intended to be used. And we get that all the time. So just at least the VXX does relatively what it's supposed to do. I would just say it is not a good long-term trade, no more than a you know one or two days or three days, something like so that. So you, you wouldn't be a Buffett buy and hold man in VXX then? Mm -hmm. No, I'm I'm sure somewhere there's some fun guy uh, that works for him that probably has you know all the short open interest in the product. Exactly, all of it, all of it completely. And speaking, because he knows value and that don't have any. 
<laughs> Speaking of Mr. Buffett, he made one of his right hand men today uh, made a uh, made a comment that I think a lot of people here have echoed, and I, I don't want to beat it to death because it kind of gets into the whole HFT is evil. But I thought it was kind of funny because he literally said that it was his number two guy, Munger Munger. I forgot what the guy's name is, uh, and he Charlie said Charlie Munger. Munger, yeah. He said in an interview today that high frequency trading is quote legalized front running, which I think has a degree of truth to it. Certainly, you see what's coming out of the CME le- recently, where they've had to revamp all of Globex because a lot of the HFT guys had figured out a way a way to get about one to ten uh, I think milliseconds ahead of the orders, and that was enough to generate some serious front running. So there is a, a certain kernel of truth to what he's saying. And he went on to say, and it's basically evil. <laughs> And it never should have been allowed to get this big, as big as it is. So everyone always says kind of in not so uncertain terms, HFT is evil, HFT is evil. This is a guy who actually comes out and literally says it. So I thought that was kind of funny. Uh, we'll just, I think, let our listeners uh, mull that over in their heads. One last thing before we close up the old trading block, head on into the odd block. We do have some earnings right now, including Electronic Arts came out after the close. They closed today. They rallied quite a bit today, up about 2% to close at around 1830. In the after hours, they're hugging that level, it seems like, about 1830, offered at 1845. Looks like whatever the news was, if it's out, wasn't exactly uh, lighting up the old tape. We saw a lot of people betting that it would, picking up about 3,000 May 19s uh, just in the uh, final hours of the day here today thinking this rally was going to continue and that straddle went out about a buck 30 looks like if, if this holds course that's uh one of the sales of the month so uh anyway we'll keep an eye on that through the rest of the show but now we're going to keep on rolling right on into the odd block it's time to break down the most interesting unusual and downright questionable options activity that's been identified by the optionsinsider.com it's time for the odd block. All right, everybody, welcome to the old odd block. Don your fedoras if you've got them, because Andrew and I are certainly wearing ours. And we're going to kick things off in the old odd block today with a newcomer to the odd block at least one i can't recall talking about in quite a while this is nsm national i'm sorry nation star mortgage holdings inc this is a non-bank residential mortgage service provider and they closed today 37 dollars and 74 cents up about two and a half cents i'm sorry up about two and a half percent on the day today and this is the name that typically does about three to four thousand contracts a day doing a whopping twenty seven thousand today so really Really lighten up the old tape, nearly 8x on the old ADV. And pretty much, not all of it, but a substantial portion of that came in one massive trade or a few massive trades here on the May 40 strike where call buyers were just devouring these May 40 calls. A lot of them lighten up the tape earlier today for about 70 cents. Uh, one big block went up, looks like about 13,000 times for 70 cents. They went out 60 at 80, so that guy did his homework, split the market right right down the middle there. A total of 15,444 contracts on the day. So five, three to four, let's say about four to five X of uh, of the ADV just in that strike alone. So a lot of calls lighting up the old tape today in NSM, huh, Andrew? Uh, there were. There was uh, just huge volume, I think, for a name. And I, I, to me, I just looking at looking at how the volume trade at the time looked like a pretty just a just a big overrider of calls. Um, the stock is trading, you know, along along near the highs, 52 week highs. So it just I think these calls made a nice uh, a nice buy ride actually going into earnings uh which are on the seventh so just trying to i it just for a long stockholder uh kind of riding it up they're like okay well we'll take this uh 70 cents for you know basically the next three weeks uh which is probably a nice little return for uh somebody along the stock and that's what it looked like i mean you got some little earnings coming out and of course this big paper you know hitting the bid so it looked it looked kind of like a savvy customer whacking them out volatility was down though a bit today um on those sales and i have a feeling that might be from that maybe from the mbi bank of america mortgage uh deal you know they made uh one of the things that drove bank of america up today a lot was a settlement mortgage settlement talk so maybe that lifted kind of the sector uh, a little bit and crushed the ball in here so 
So even without any earnings quite yet, uh, they, they smacked the, this was, a, I looked to me like a pretty good sized call sale. Yeah, speaking of trading near the bid, I was reading some interesting studies recently about how a lot of the insiders in the option space are starting to get savvy to people uh, trying to ferret out their intent by where they're trading on the bid-ass spread. So they're doing everything they can to try to inflate the NBBO ahead of when they're buying some of these calls so they can look like they're buying on the bid. It looks like a sale, you know, so they can kind of, <laughs> they can kind of deflect some of the regulatory oversight with, oh, look, he, bid it, he, he traded on the bid. This guy was obviously dumping calls. Call, of course, that's a pretty, that's a pretty surface uh, way to cover it up because anyone who, you know, who does what we do here on the show knows to dig into implied vol and things like that and to really ferret out what's going on. So you're not going to be able to hide that for long. But I think from a cursory examination, that could certainly do the trick. And I probably, I would imagine a lot of the regulators are doing mostly cursory examinations of this stuff, if at all. Uh, uh, yeah, I, 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 I would be surprised. The regulators should hire us to do this kind of unusual activity, and we would. <laughs> in a couple of weeks, they would have a good idea how it all works. Exactly. But they should. They should call. come to our event on May fifteenth, and so should you, the listener. If you like this kind of stuff we're talking about here, we're going to dive really deep into the dark side uh, at the SIBO on the fifteenth. So, theoptionsinsider.com/events. Get your tickets before the last few seats are filled and we have to say no to you and i would really be sad if we had to say no so by all means uh get on in there get the last couple of seats before they're snapped up speaking of things being snapped up today we're going to move on to ntap this is network appliances inc they manufacture storage systems and data management solutions for it companies and this one closed today at about 35 dollars and a half up about one and a half percent on the day today this is the name that Actually does some fairly decent volume uh, day in, day out, doing about 22,000 contracts a day on average and nearly doubling that today to 42,000 contracts with uh, the bulk of that. Again, we, we seem to have themes here in the odd block of late, Andrew, and today was once again uh, people coming in. Not this time, though, uh, instead of gobbling up some calls, they were uh, they were blasting away on these uh, June 34s. Looks like a bunch of them, about 5,500 going up early in the morning for about 269 uh, today, an interesting price, uh, nonetheless. June 34 is with a total of about 8,500 going up on the day today. Of course, a lot of open interest on that strike, so some of that could have been closing, but it looks like that volume really uh, piqued your curiosity today, Mr. Lobster. Yeah, because I saw it some on the May strike, the May 34 strike. I couldn't really see how it was going up the spread. I thought it might be a long call uh, seller rolling. Uh, again, I think this has felt a lot like a sort of a, um, we've got the rallying market and the long stockholders are taking the earnings reports, uh, which is kind of the theme here. And they're using that as an opportunity to just write calls. They're like, OK, volatility is higher, so I'm going to sell. And we have a lot of this inverted uh, vol where the implied vol is trading in the, let's say in this case, the mid 30s. Uh, the 10-day volatility is in the 20s. So it just is a good opportunity to sell some juice. And, uh, and I think that's what they're doing here because their earnings are the 21st, so well within this cycle. And they're just taking the money. They decided to take the money now. So I find uh, – I think it's an interesting way to sort of – and notice like you know when you sell a more in the money call here, you're kind of – it's a more aggressive uh, delta hedge too. You know, they're saying, okay, I, I want only some so much upside, but I really feel like I want to protect my gain a little more. Uh, that's why they sell the more, you know, more at the money or just in the money strike like this. Yeah, it's a more, definitely more aggressive trade. We see a lot of guys, too, who are the yield hunters uh, of late have migrated a lot of their covered call writing into that closer to the put wing area of the of the skew just to try to get a little bit of that put bump in there yep. because the covered call wing has just been so decimated in a lot of these names that if you're looking for yield and you're writing the traditional 5% out of the money call every month or every week, uh, you're not exactly doing too well these days. So migrating yeah. it down a little bit, you get a little bit more bang for your buck. You get called away more often. But then again, as I tell a lot of our covered call writers who write into us all the time and lament that, I say, actually, that's a good thing. <laughs> you want to get <laughs> you want to get called away. That's a good thing. That means it's working. You could do it again. Uh, you win. <laughs> in fact, I just ha I just had this conversation with my father not a couple days ago. I had to discuss that whole thing with him. He's finally coming to the dark side of options, and he was a little bit distressed that his Ford stock had been called away, and I had to walk him through why that was a good thing. 
and how he could do it all over again. He's like, oh, you know, you're right. <laughs> I was like, yeah, you know, I have been doing this for a little bit. Um, anyway, <laughs> that interesting side note, uh, notwithstanding, we're going to wrap things up here with uh, GTE. This is Grand T Era Energy, another one, one of our odd block specials trading six bucks. Uh, we like these little ones sometimes. This is the name that doesn't really light up the old tape. Usually, anyway, doing about 200 contracts a day, so not exactly an options blockbuster. But today, it certainly fit the bill doing 20x that with about 4,000 contracts, lighting up the old tape, uh, including about 2,600 of the Nove 7 halves and 1,200 of the Nove 5s. This is someone who clearly has some love. Uh, he was scooping up those Nove 7 halves for 35 cents, lifting the offer. And on the no fives, uh, I'll have to dig in and get some prices on those. But yeah, it looks like it's a lot of, a lot of love coming one, up one, here. Oh, in... sorry, Mark. Just 145 to one. Well, right around 145 to 135 for the uh, no fives. So yeah, a lot of, lot of love here. If you look at the chart on uh, on GTE, it has been uh, vacillating around quite a bit in this five to six range for the better part of the year. So this guy obviously thinking that there's a lot of, a lot of room to the upside between now. And uh, and between now and November, I haven't had a chance to parse out what he done those no fives. I'm assuming he wasn't writing them and doing a ratio or something like that. But um, it's it's possible. I didn't. I just didn't see that. You know, they're not marking them. And I thought when I saw it originally, they went up on different exchanges. I mean, that that would have been an awful lot of work. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Usually, listeners, for, when you see something like this go up, it usually all goes up in one place, just for the ease of use of the executing broker for no other reason. If you're working it across multiple exchanges, you're doing a lot of execution work. Hey, I take my hat off to you if you can do it that way, but uh, it's certainly a lot of extra effort just for a, a, a relatively small one by two. But it does. Yeah, it does... And I didn't see the the volume didn't really go up like that, so it, it would have been a lot of little pieces on the uh, on the no five side. So, and the time is all out of sequence. Maybe uh, maybe he's doing the two saw special ratio call stupid. Which I know Tucson is, is a big fan of. These I, you days. know, to be honest, I just think this is kind of a bye-bye. You know, this is one of those little oil exploration companies. Every once in a while, they catch fire, uh, no pun intended, um, and rip. And it's just, I think this is somebody. Just, I feels like some. I'd be interested to see if the open interest is is higher tomorrow, uh, mostly because I think it feels like just somebody seems to be getting more in, where they want to build a position in this this thing another title for your forthcoming book get more in the andrew Giovinazzi story <laughs> get more in it's it's not a lot of money well it's it's you know it's weird the market changes character from everybody selling options to maybe buying again because oh maybe this rally's for real you know <laughs> so we'll see all right and with your potential titles swirling in the brains of our listeners we're going to close out the old odd block like i said if you want any more of the, about these these alerts we discussed today you can read the full text of them on the optionsinsider.com. We also have quite a few more up there for your reading pleasure. And if you are at all interested in this unusual activity content, then by all means, love to see you in Chicago on May 15th. Theoptionsinsider.com slash events is coming down to the wire. So it's one of the last times I'm going to have a chance to say that to you, dear listeners. So looking forward to seeing you in Chicago on the 15th. And now we're going to keep on rolling right on into the Express Block. The Express Block, brought to you by Options Express. Options Express lets you trade where and when you want for every level of trading, from advanced charting, free daily trading ideas, and free educational resources. Options Express is the online broker for all traders. Best of all, Options Express allows you to trade stocks, options, and futures all in a single account on powerful yet easy to use trading platforms, including mobile devices. Visit optionsexpress.com/oxradio for your free account. Options Express Express is a member of FINRA, SIPC, and NFA. All right, and welcome to the Express Block. This is, of course, the portion of the show where I hand the reins over to the Viceroy himself. And he takes over the show and brings us into the land known as OX. Mr. Jacobson, I know uh, you, you touched on the top of the show. There were a couple of names really lighting up the old tape at OX today. Tesla was one. That's kind of surprising. That's a throwback to the days when that's why I was thinking Grigus because John and I used to discuss that on the show quite a bit and the dangers of writing downside when it was trading in the 18 to 20 range. Now today it closed pushing nearly 60. Uh, yeah, it closed today 59 half. So a lot of OX customers feeling the love for Tesla. Are they premium riders perhaps out in Tesla, I should say? 
yeah, Mark, I think it's what, what we're seeing up here is sort of akin to the experience uh, you mentioned your father had. Uh, see a lot of stuff trading up through strikes that, that uh, I don't think people had any expectation we'd get to. Um, and you're seeing it in Apple coming back, Google coming back, Google in the 860 area now. You know, you look at this stuff a week ago, and Apple was $400, and Google was, you know, right around $700. Last time you looked at Tesla, it was high 40s, and now it's 60. So I think there's a lot of that going on, and of course, that's what happens when you get a bull market run uh, like this. Uh, on the downside, Lulu lost a uh, little bit of bid today and had a bunch of news hitting it, and Lulu traded back below 75 you know a couple of weeks ago they had the the see-through yoga pants debacle and they traded in the 60s and then everybody said that's come and gone and it got back up into the high 70s now it's kicking back down again but overall today it wasn't it wasn't a day where uh when i did listen in the phones were jumping off the hook it seemed like a a pretty steady day but uh somewhat of a quiet day um, but that's what we saw lighten up uh, customer accounts here today. I'm just looking up Tesla while we're chatting here and seeing how in these weeklies, uh, these strikes are just lighting up the tape all the way up and down the chain. Everyone's loving Tesla weekly options, They're doing uh, quite a bit of volume, even down to the uh, the 44 strike and 45 strike in the weekly. So, uh, And all the way up to the 67 half strike in the weekly. So, yeah, people are... People are active in Tesla. This is pretty funny. If you roll out to the regular maze, it gets even even more active. I was going to save this for around the block, but maybe we should. But uh, just, yeah, interesting stuff uh, lurking in the land of Tesla. But for now, time to close out the old express block and keep on rolling right on into our listener mail block. Now it's time to empty the mailbag and see what our listeners have to say. It's the mail block. All right, and we went a little long on the old odd block, so we'll just squeeze in one quick question here today on the old mail block. This comes from one of our Twitter Twitter followers, uh, Billy Mo, I believe his handle is, and he writes, Do you guys think the Jumbo Spy will be listed on all exchanges, and will it be penny-wide? Uh, great question, Billy. Uh, we touched on this a little bit in recent shows. Of course, I just came back from the Options Industry Conference in Las Vegas, where this was very much top of mind for a lot of people over there at the conference, particularly in light of the, the meltdown over at the SIBO and everyone taking another look at proprietary products like SPX and VIX and scratching their chins and saying, hmm, perhaps we need an alternative. I think that event, if no other, really gave life to this uh, jumbo SPY product. I think on the Prior to that, it had some interest, but it was also a lot of people were saying, oh, the BD is not going to really want to promote this because it, it cuts into their commissions from SPY. But now with uh, the shutdown of the SIBO, I think a lot of people are taking a second look at this being a perhaps necessary safety valve for the marketplace. I'm sure the regulators will see it that way uh, going forward. So I think the events of the last couple of weeks have made the jumbo SPY much more of a reality. If you've been if you've been tracking this, uh, this actually jumbo spy. I'm sorry, jumbo spy is the. If I can remember these names, and if he's referring to the, if he's referring to the right one, is there's two floating around out there. There's jumbo spy and max spy. I believe max spy is the one that's the simple straight up 10x SPY. The jumbo spy, I believe, was the ISE proposal, which is where they actually tried to recreate kind of their own uh, SPX type index product, and that got shot down by a lot of courts as violating uh, some patents and licenses from the McGraw Hill to the SIBO. So if he's referring to the more max buy type product that the box is proposing, then I think that definitely has a, a very strong uh, chance of of passing muster on the regulatory side, particularly given what happened over the past few weeks. Will it be a penny wide? I, I don't know. The, the launch of the minis has given me a little bit less faith on any new product, even one that's as supported supposedly by the industry and as m anticipated as the minis were. Look how wide they were when they launched. Uh, market maker support really not not being too thorough for them. And a lot of market makers these days, they've been so decimated in a lot of their products, they're really playing a wait and see game with new products, not spending the time and resources to list them until they see there's some volume going on in there. So it's a bit of the old catch-22 uh, in these new products. So I think 
given what we saw in the weeklies, if the Jumbo slash Max, let's just put them together, Jumbo Max Spy, if that product ever does launch, I wouldn't be surprised to see it be a little bit wider than you might anticipate, at least in the initial days until people it can get some legs underneath it and people can see it's actually got some staying power. Then more of the liquidity providers may follow suit. Andrew, Mike, or Alex, you guys want to weigh in here for our pal, Mr. Billy? I have a couple thoughts on it. Oh, go ahead, Alex. Go ahead. Starts trading on Friday. Approved today. So ah, there it, it goes. Up on Friday. Just, just came and through as we're getting ready for the show. The approval came through. So there's your answer, uh, Mr. Yeah, so Mr. Billy Moe. This will be the opportunity for some of the smaller exchanges. Uh, obviously, the driver here is Box. And this will be the driver for some of the smaller exchanges to uh, showcase what they can do. Because... Um, we talked a little bit about what regulators want and don't want, and regulators have an agenda. The assumption that regulators are ever agnostic is, uh, in my experience, a fiction. And uh, I, will it list on all exchanges? I expect it will. Uh, obviously, it's going to trade in pennies. Will it be a penny wide? No. Uh, I bet it'll be, I bet the markets will be dimes. 10, 20, 30 cent wide. But this is a real opportunity for one of the exchanges to really open up its trading network uh, and, and, and do what the CME does in the E-mini, let customers post bids and offers and get aggressive because uh, this thing uh, could be huge, uh, especially if markets are competitive. It's it's dead on arrival if the markets are too wide, though. Now, are they going to have weeklies on this initially, or just start out with monthlies? How are they going to? Does anyone know that? Everything you're going to have everything leaps, weeklies. It it it's going to be real fun starting this week. Well, I'm going to be watching that for sure. Yeah, I mean, it's at least for the liquidity providers. It's still a fungible product, it's marginable. It's just trading the spy. It's just a bigger chunk, so. Very interesting. Now everybody just learned how to, to to create their gamma backwards with the minis. Now they're going to have to do their deltas and their position sizing <laughs> the other way with the jumbos. <laughs> you don't buy after, one after lot. Market, like, Wait a minute, what happened? <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say after Mark and I arm wrestled over SPX versus SPY on Thursday show, uh, I went and looked at the trust. The SPY trust has 130 billion in it. And, you know, we talked a little earlier about VXX. Clearly, these, the, 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 the spot products have had huge traction from the community. And some of it may be because it makes good sense. Some of it may be because it's convenient. And some of it may be because the marketing budgets at firms like Barclays and State Street are bigger than the marketing budgets at, you know, SIBO Box and ISE. But... Um, if the thing's got decent markets, if you've got 130 billion in the trust, you get you got to name people are comfortable with. Uh, this thing could take off. Uh, yeah, especially for the people trading thousand lots in them. You know, while they're like, "Wow, I can trade a hundred lot. I'll save money. Awesome." You know, I'm looking here at the uh, the release from Box, and you're right, Alex. It, this just came out. In fact, the press release is dated tomorrow. So, breaking news: you heard it here first, listeners, that the Box did get approved for uh, Jumbo Y, and it's going to start trading uh, very shortly. So, interesting stuff. I know when this question came in, it was still theoretical, and now we'll all we'll all get a chance to see for ourselves in just a couple of days. And I'd, I'd have to imagine the recent events at the SIBO really helped to fast track what's going on over here at Box. So, certainly an interesting one to keep an eye on. Speaking of keeping an eye on things, it's time to roll on into our final segment, Around the Block. Around the Block. All right, and welcome to Around the Block. This is, of course, where we break down what we're watching for the rest of this week and for the rest of the trading sessions from an options perspective. Of course, this just uh, this new wrinkle adds a lot to watch for the rest of this week. The launch of the Jumbo Spy will be very, very interesting for a lot of us here to see if this product can uh, can rally out of the gate and do a little bit better than perhaps from a volume and spread perspective than the recent launch of the minis, or if it'll be a bit of a of a challenge to get to the level everybody is expecting. Let's look here, a quick check-in again for the end of the show on Electronic Arts, see how those earnings are faring. It looks like, yeah, they are 
They close at about 1830, and they're trading 1835 at 1860 in the after hours. So another resounding meh. From uh, from a volume and from a not a volume but from a volatility and from a underlying movement perspective. So if you are a uh, one of the many OX customers who is on the premium selling side and you were playing out in EA, it looks like at least from these initial results, you're you'll be faring well. And if you're playing a lot in that video game sector, EA of course being Electronic Arts, a big video game publisher, then their counterpart, their chief rival Activision, will be reporting tomorrow, the eighth after the close. So you have back to back. Video game plays. I know I mentioned Activision many times on this show in the past as being one of my more reliable uh, risk reversal and premium rights in the past. They were very, very range bound. Uh, I haven't been playing out there of late. They closed today at about $14.88, down 30 cents or 2%. They were over $15 for a while there, which is extremely high for Activision. They were in the 10 half to 12 range for quite a long time uh, when I was trading them very aggressively. Of course, we also have. Tomorrow, after the close, actually, Disney. And uh, Disney closing today at $65, pretty much even on the day. This one, the force has really been with Disney since they announced their acquisition of Star Wars last year, up about 35% since then. Kind of hard to bet against the old mouse house when they have Marvel and Star Wars in their stable, and both of those things are pretty much licenses to print money. Uh, So the market, certainly liking this one. Uh, Looking today, this, this straddle going out at about... Oh, almost three bucks here. About uh, about t- actually about two sixty or so. Uh, so expecting a little bit of movement. Mike or Andrew, you guys do anything with Disney these days on your clients? Not with Disney, but yeah, I think it's it's tough to bet against them with everything that they have in their favor right now, for sure. Yeah, not, I have nothing from uh, nothing on Disney, but I just remember uh, somebody having a bail on it in 2002. A gigantic block went up at like 12 bucks a share or something like oh, that. That stings <laughs> right now. <laughs> that guy is drowning his sorrows at some really cheap dive bar right now. Saying, yes, I, I think it's kind of like if somebody, oh, who was it? Maybe a bass. Somebody had one fund that I guess just needed to raise some cash fast. So they sold what they had that was worth the most money. And it was that. I remember it was a giant trade, though. Uh, that, one, that one stings. Speaking of yeah. stinging, uh, Groupon also have an earnings after uh, out on the eighth. Uh, I know, I know, uh, Andrew, you guys have been uh, watching Groupon a little bit of late, mostly from a mocking perspective. I know Mr. Grigas got long around the five handle. Hopefully, he's long since uh, been writing premium against it and got called away. But you guys uh, doing anything with Groupon here? I know you bullish risk reversals, Zynga, Groupon. Yeah, we. You know, what we usually do is we put on one by two ratio spreads and earnings. Basically, we just think it's a piece of junk if we can get a ratio for a credit. It just doesn't – it's like – it's almost like saying it doesn't feel like it can go down a whole lot more. And, and you just – but usually we do those trades usually one day before. So I think we have one more day for Groupon. So you're talking like a five, five-half, one-by-two or something like that? or Exactly. I think we were doing – there was for a while there. They're pretty good like the five-fours or something like that uh, just depending on where they jacked the ball up to. But – uh, I just we I got to see how you know the pricing line could change by tomorrow. But normally that's something that we look at. Everybody's like, hey, what about Groupon? So, but nothing super exciting out of that name since that guy resigned. Yeah, he took yeah. his hundred couple hundred million bucks he made and said, see you later. Yeah, cry me a river for that guy, Mister Mister Mike, Uncle Mike. What are you watching for the rest of this week, sir? I'm watching Dow 15,000. Um, you notice on Friday we touched it and came back down. Uh, combine that with um, I guess the somewhat, you could say, lower VIX of below 13 anyway. Combine th- those two things along with the third thing is the fact that all the pretty much everyone you saw in the fi- or from what I saw in the financial media on Friday was just making it sound like oh everything's better now and. It just there's too many people predicting the Dow going to 16,000 or 18,000 or things like that, and I'm very cautious right now. But if we go past 15,000, I'm forced to jump on the train, and I will if need be. Last but not least, Mr. Alex, Mr. Viceroy, what are you watching for the rest of this week, sir? Well, Friday will be Maxis, uh, and it'll be interesting to see what's going on there. Had a couple people stop by my desk today and ask me what a Dow theory confirmation is, because apparently that was in the journal uh, today, uh, confirming uh, or or will we confirm the new highs? And I know every time I say these are macro issues, uh, somebody goes, well, he's the old guy. Don't listen to him. 
Uh, but it's macro issues. Ten-year got back up into the 175 yield area, and vol keeps going down. I mean, that's the setup for uh, a continuing good market. So uh, looking at, I hate to use the word, fundamentals. Uh, all right. Thank you for that, Alex. And that is going to do it for our Around the Block segment. But before we go, I do like to check in with my cohorts here on the old All-Star panel to see what they're looking at and what's coming up in their neck of the woods that may interest you, the listener. Starting off with you, Mr. Uncle Mike Tussaud, what is coming up on the old webinar train in RCM land this week? Well, I was discussing this with the birdies, and we're taking a week off this week, but... I, I planted this little seed with the birdies. I smell a ratio spread webinar coming in the near future. More to come in the next show or two. Ooh, ratio spreads. Exciting, sir. I like it. <laughs> you should, I still, I'm still waiting for that stupid webinar. I thought that's every week. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> I like it, sir. From your mouth and not mine. I like it. Good stuff. All right, Mr. Andrew, what is coming up in the land of the pit? Uh, mostly, we're actually we're watching Apple a lot. Uh, it has been a, an interesting trade, mostly because it's just ripping up stuff like butterflies and things like that. Uh, lots of, you know, just looking around for the stocks that have been moving. Uh, also, the outperformance of uh, the Qs relative, I think, to the SPY, mostly because the Qs have lagged most of the year and they're starting to catch up now. So we're looking at that to see if that can keep going. Uh, kind of this Apple, Google, Microsoft juggernaut, uh, just, you know, gobbling up market value. So, and I don't, it doesn't feel like, it's like none of those stocks are really what we'll call expensive. They trade at relatively low multiples. Uh, Google's a little higher, like 20 PE or something, but Microsoft is what, 10 or 11, Apple's 11. It's not like there's any growth built into any of these companies. So all of a sudden people look at a lot of the NASDAQ and they're like, well, where's this whole index been for the last three years hasn't been anywhere so i would not be surprised if money that was looking for dollars you know that was was looking at the spy or you know looking at the uh, the broader market oil and financials and humble has all kind of made a run like wait a minute these are a lot of cheap technology companies here that pay you know two two three percent dividends so i again i i've been kind of banging that drum but uh, and I'm continuing to bang the drum because I'm writing it, but I don't see that changing anytime soon. You know, what's really funny is we have this thing on the 15th, I think, with this guy, Mark Longo yeah, or something. He's, he's a shady Mark character. I've, I've, cur I've cautioned you many times to stay away from that guy, but you, just, you tend not to One listen to One thing that I was impressed, and I know I'm flogging this on, on the Option Insider Radio Network, are all the goodies somebody gets for going to this. It, uh, it is pretty book, crazy. <laughs> option Pit Live, Market Taker Coaching, Live All Pro, Option Alert. I mean, all Option Vision, all kinds of tools for looking at the market to try it out. Amazing. Just, just really, I, I don't know. I think it's a pretty darn good value. I had a couple I mean, people call that's me. That's just me. I had a couple people call me today uh, looking for some questions about the event, and they were all kind of incredulous at that exact thing, that the value. Like, really? You're giving all of this for 99 bucks? I said, yeah, you know, we, wanna, we wanted to kind of go overboard for people. Since they're so used to getting free stuff from us, so we wanted to make sure they got a ridiculous bang for their buck, and I, I think we achieved that. Uh, some people are actually, they, they don't think the event is real. They're like, really? You're doing this? I'm like, yeah, we're doing this, so. <laughs> it just shows you the power of Mark Longo in the option industry to twist all our arms. There backward. you go. I squeeze all of you guys uh, to the fence squeeze for the benefit like for the benefit of you, the listener. <laughs> exactly. All right, and thank you for that plug, sir. Of course, he is referring to our unusual activity forum on May fifteenth. At the old CBOE, if you haven't registered for it, it is indeed that ridiculous of a deal. You do get all that crazy stuff uh, to uh, to attend our event. So by all means, take advantage of our ridiculous generosity, how much we're squeezing all of our partners uh, to give you some great stuff. So you can just show up, get a tour, learn some great stuff, and get a bunch of great swag all for 99 bucks. Theoptionsinsider.com slash events. Be there. I think you'll be quite sad because it's going to be a pretty fun event and you don't get to come home with such a great goodie bag. All right. And last but certainly not least, Mr. Alex, I know you guys have your big shindig coming up over at OX. Is that correct? Yeah. We have a big event, which unfortunately is full uh, here in Chicago this Saturday. So, uh, I, you know, not a lot I can, I can do to talk about it because 
it is a full house, but that tells you the appetite in the investor community. Um, tomorrow's uh, one of the webinars, Jim Wyckoff from the Wyckoff Letter, noon Chicago time, is going to be talking about what he sees in the futures market for the next month. And Wednesday, an old friend of mine and a guy I've done a lot of seminars with, Dan Gramza, is going to talk about using stochastic strategies uh, in futures. Dan's a real articulate guy. I, I met him at a, at a customer seminar some years back for, uh, for a competitor, and, and we had the advanced room and spent the day with a couple hundred customers down in Dallas, Texas, and it, it was great. Um, and then Friday, maxis, jumbos, whatever they're going to be called. There's an interesting dynamic here because this changes the playing field. And I know to some of the listeners, uh, they only really care about markets and what they pay. But this could change the dynamic of the option community. So it's going to be interesting to watch it evolve on Friday. All right. Thank you for that, Alex. And of course, on behalf of everyone here on the old all-star panel, I want to thank all of you out there in the listening audience. We couldn't really do this without you guys. So thanks for subscribing and downloading and streaming. And of course, writing in with such great questions. Keep up the great stream of questions. You can find us on Twitter, twitter.com slash options or on Facebook. Just search for Options Insider. Or of course, you can leave a comment on our website, theoptionsinsider.com or just shoot us a direct question email at questions at theoptionsinsider.com. Just be sure to put in the subject line which show you're looking to discuss and we'll route it to the appropriate show. And on behalf of Alex and Andrew and Mike and myself, we want to thank all of you for listening and we'll see you next time right here on The Option Block. Become a part of The Option Block. Just visit www.theoptionsinsider.com slash forum to post a question for the hosts. You can also submit questions to twitter.com slash option block or leave a voicemail at 312-544-9356. Make it interesting and your question just might make it on the air. The Options Block is property of the Options Insider Incorporated. All rights reserved. presentation of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com/radio or search for Options Insider Radio in iTunes.